So all great questions I got. Um, and, uh, it's, it's nice because some people are eager to have more details about the things. I was trying to keep a different high level of detail. Some other people asked me about applications, so I'm wonderful. I love that. So um, feel free to ask me any questions whenever you want, uh, Amir, um, for, for this. OK, so limitation. So I gave you um, a, a little, it's a glimpse again of what we do. So you choose your system. You have uh, some boundary conditions. You, there are a lot of tricks that I didn't talk about. Um, but what you do is basically getting trajectories. Once you have all those data, you need to analyze them. So something is simple, like the temperature, something is more complicated, you start looking at the structures. Um, and then there is also the dynamic property, so diffusion coefficient. You know, um, it's a number usually that you use, but comes from how the atoms are moving. Same as a free energy. So I'll show you um, application. So first of all, limitation, time scale. And that's one of the questions I got also. So you need to have a short time step for the stability, for example, of the system. And also remember that if you're interested in vibration of the molecules, the time step needs to be at the same order of magnitude. So if you have a vibration that is one femtosecond, just to give you a number, and you have 10 femtoseconds, then you're losing the information. So you need a relatively small time step. Okay. Um, structural changes, you know, you go with the one femtosecond, but sometimes um, structural change that can um, take up to 10 to the minus second or microsecond. So you cannot get the full picture. You get part of the pictures. So you have to find some tricks for that. Um, the advance in computer power has enabled definitely longer simulations here. So we, the, the better computer, the more we are running those things. Um, but from the point of view of longer time scale simulation, you have, uh, we had a few things. So one is the algorithm that has been proved. Then there is a parallel computing, there's another two things. And the third one is GPUs that we use a lot for the simulations. So why MD is so computational intensive? So that's the first question. Um, you need to take many time steps, especially if your delta T is very small and you want to cover a reasonably long time scale, then you have a lot of time steps that you have to cover. Um, there is a lot of computation in each time step. So um, can we, so the question is, and I think it's something that you guys asked me also during the break, can we ignore interaction beyond um, atoms separated by more than some fixed cutoff? So that's a, a trick that we usually use. So I'm saying, like, uh, my molecule is here, my atom is here, and the atom is so far away. Do I need to consider this interaction? Or I can say, you know, I'm looking only at the interaction of this atom with whatever is in this uh, uh, radius from the distance, OK? So that's usually what they call a cutoff time distance that you have in your simulation. So you say, I'm going to integrate the equation up to this distance, something that we use. Um, another thing is that uh, uh, Van der Waals interactions, so type of the forces that we talked about before a little bit, they fall off with the distance. So farther, the least important they become. Um, while instead, electrostatic um, fall off slowly with the distance. This is an important point. Uh, sometimes it depends on the system you're interested, in, but some interaction you can neglect if you're far away, others don't. So um, Van der Waals is okay. Electrostatic, no, you cannot do that at all. So careful about that. Um, so how can I in speed up my MD simulations? So to reduce the amount of time, computation per step, time step. And so faster algorithm has been a research area that people have been looking at. Um, uh, another thing is that can I um, uh, reduce the number of time staff for the simulations? And so one way is to increase the time step uh, fold um, by several fold by freezing some of the very motion. So for example, if you're not interested in uh, uh, some uh, um, fast motion, then you can neglect those and you can get something that is uh, take a longer time step for this. Um, Another thing, that, another trick that usually you play is a lot, you make events of interest take place more quickly. 
So, for example, let's assume that uh, your molecule, you want to look at the collision of two things, and they are farther away. You know, instead of starting your simulation here, you start your simulation here. Okay. So, or sometimes what we do is, um, um, if you want to look at dimerization, you start from them already together. Remember that the first part is just to equilibrate the system, and then you find the optimal point in those conditions. So instead of going from far away and waiting over time that they get together, you start here, and then you let first the system equilibrate at that conditions, and then you start seeing what happened to the, um, uh, the molecules. Um, another important thing, and this is what we have been using, so I'll tell you in a second, is uh, apply what they call artificial forces. So when you have, uh, and I'll show you in a second, the potential energy, so you have a well, you don't want to spend all your time in one well. You want to make sure that your system is exploring the whole landscape. And so there are tricks that you do with that. Um, so let me, I'm going a little bit faster here because I want to show you the result. Um, so one approach that we've been using is called metadynamics. And it's basically, um, we have been using to look at the free energy of the systems. And what you do, you start from, uh, um, let's say that you have a landscape like this, and you have uh, some kind of energy in the system. And let's say that your molecules are here. Remember that they have in a dip, it means that they are kind of uh, stable, it's a local uh, minimum. What you want to make sure is that over time, basically, this assist, you explore the whole potential. So you don't want your molecules stuck here for a long time, but you want to make sure that you explore all the valleys in your landscape. And so an artifact, and I have a movie for that in a second, is basically to add an artificial forces to the system so that um, they go out of the well into other wells. And that's a, a kind of a trick of the algorithm that I was talking about, and I'll show you an application. The other one is uh, um, parallelize the simulation across multiple computers. Of course, practically, that's another thing that you can do. Um, or another thing is to perform a lot of short simulation. So depending on the system, there are tricks you can play also with the type of computer simulations that you have. Of course, there are issues about communication. If you have multiple uh, computers, then they need to communicate. So there is uh, also that that needs to be taken into account. And the last part, just to make this uh, faster, is that the computer chips, so GPUs, we use them, so graphic processor units, um, they basically pack more arithmetics on the chip than the traditional CPU, okay? And then you have also um, specialized chips like Anton, so these are all things that you learn once you're interested in computer simulations and you know how you want to start. Okay, so um, let, let's see what happened in combustion because that's what I think. Mm. I've been talking about molecular dynamics and also again the distinction between the me right during this. So as a quick summary, I want to show you this again: modeling versus simulations. Modeling is developing a mathematical representation, so the algorithm we talked about. Uh, simulation is a solving the equation that arose from the development of the model, okay? So, quick question for you. Which one do you think is a modeling? Which one do you think is a, a simulation here? And uh, show me your hands for a modeling. Which one do you think and a number one is a modeling? It's a modeling. <laughs> Why you guys thought it was a simulation? So simulation is more running, right? Your system. Um, modeling is about how you can idealize what, what are the characteristics of your ideal description of the system. Um, I know this is a little kind of maybe trivial, but I think it is also a nomenclature that we need all to agree on. So time step, what do you think? Simulation, great. Uh, choice of boundary conditions. Modeling. Um, implementation of boundary conditions. Choice of the system. Very good. Okay, so let's go here now. I want to show you this. Hopefully it's going to do what you want to do. 
Okay, why I'm doing this? Because, um, so you start from uh, your, a blob that are your atoms together. So let me go back to the things. And so right now, I don't have any here. The atoms are only, there is no kind of bond between them. Okay, they're just taking together. So in the moment they impact the wall that you see on the side, they fall apart because they're just bouncing in the wall. But what you see here is that uh, um, they, do, they go in different direction. You see someone rotating. So basically the collision, the impact, it breaks the molecule and they, go in, uh, they, they do different things. Now, if I add to my simulation bond, so some interaction about the potential, the type of uh, um, bond that I have, Wait, is this the next slide? Yeah, okay. Ah. What you see is that uh, uh, now the cluster somehow is uh, standing together. Now, the reason why I show you this movie is because um, what happened is that the impact, the velocity of the collision with the wall is basically absorbed by the internal degrees of the molecules. So the type of bond that you have between the atoms is able to store part of the energy that you get from the impact, okay? So how good you describe your system, how much information you have about just simple spheres or bonds, it gives you a completely different answers. And the type of bond is also, you can take the energy that comes from the impact and can be into rotation, vibration, or translation of all the atoms, okay? And again, answer is different depending on how complex you define the system and how accurate you are in your simulations. So let's get back to my combustion. Now I have the collision. So two uh, pyrene, um, there was a study that was reported um, time ago. And so what they did is taking, they took by um, two pyrene molecules and uh, um, they were prepared rotationally cold. What that means is that they didn't, they were not rotating. So even if you give a certain temperature and you should distribute the temperature into the degree of freedom, the rotation was at zero, okay? But the simulation was interesting, and so what they were looking at, this is just um, a cartoon of the, some of the pHs that you can find in the flame, but this is the type of simulation, and what they found is that the, um, they had the two pyrene molecules going towards each other, and again, the rotation was at zero, so, um, but, but the problem is that, so the idea is that they look at the impact and what they saw is with molecular dynamics, the idea was how long do they stay together, basically, okay? And so the dimer gets together and you, um, they see that they like to dance with each other, basically. Now, the question is uh, how do you define a dimer? Because, you know, they can get together, but eventually after a little bit of time, they can fall apart. So when you talk about the dimerization and two things getting together, an important thing is uh, for how long they stay together, okay? So they survive enough to be a nuclei, one of the nuclei for soot, or they after a while fall apart. So one of the things that they have, uh, the way you answer this question is you consider the collision in the gas phase, the time scale of this collision, and, and then you compare with the lifetime of the dimer. If the dimer stays together long enough to allow a collision, then it's a reasonable uh, guess to be one of the nuclei for the suit, okay? So I wanna show you some of the results that we got with the molecular dynamic simulation, the question. So remember, that we are still in the graph in which we have the gas phase. I wanna try to understand how dimerization or any type of this interaction physical growth can lead to something bigger. And so I wanna show you briefly some results that we got for fullerens, for fullerens with the pH, and then the free energy that I was talking about. So next one, it was a little bit the movie I showed you before. So we were interested in understanding if I have a, like a bigger particle, in this case it was a fulleran, and I have a, I'm in presence of a lot of pHs, will they stack on these nanoparticles? Um, and 
trying to see, you know, how big this nuclei they needs to be in order to um, uh, stack. And again, when you do the simulation here, you can see that there is vibration, there is rotation, there is everything in your simulation uh, that we take into account. So just to give you uh, some uh, results, so here, maybe this is one. So we look at the MD simulations of different fullerens. We had the different sizes. Remember, the nanoparticles are bigger, so we need some kind of um, um, way to describe those nanoparticles. For the moment, here today is a sphere, so I'm looking at fullerens. And so we had the different sizes. So we had a C60, so all 60 carbon atoms, 80, 120, 180, sorry, at 240. Okay, and so we run the simulations, we set our temperature, we have the initial uh, um, number of uh, fullerens in your box. Now you know, we set the temperature, the initial distribution. And what you see, the goal here is that if you look at the number of fullerens per clusters, okay, so how many of those form a cluster, if you have uh, a temperature that is, say, 500, 1000 here, and your system is C60, the higher the temperature, the, you basically don't form a cluster, okay? If you increase the size of your fuller, and so you go to 80, 180, and 1240, then you start seeing some cluster formation. So increasing the size, you will see that they form cluster at a higher temperature. So remember, you are in a flame, so the temperature is very high. What the question we are trying to answer here is that what is the size of the cluster of the nanoparticle, if you want, that I need to form a cluster, okay? So the question is, I want to grow by physics, the physical growth, as I was showing this, you know, the Van der Waals interaction, there is no chemistry. The question is, how big I need to be for them to stick together? And the answer with MD that we were looking here is basically this one. I need a size that is reasonable, like for example, 240 atoms to see the formation of some cluster in a temperature range that we are interested in, okay? So that was the first thing. Um, one of the questions that people ask is that, okay, I have this pyrene, but then I keep growing. How big I need to be so that the physical growth is important? And this is one of the, um, the questions that you can answer with this MD. The other thing that we look, always with the goal of looking at dimer formation, is uh, um, different types of pHs. So I was showing you pyrene, but as you um, might remember from yesterday, the experiment tells you that they're more complicated than pyrene. They can have uh, um, six member rings, the one above, but they can have also five member rings inside that give you a curvature. They can have uh, some aliphatic chains, but they can have the chains in between also aliphatic. Remember, some of the experiments was telling us something about the aliphatic chain and the aromatic island. And so we built a variety of pHs, okay, following some experimental evidence. And so we put the fine membrane, we put the chains, we put the in-between chains. And the idea was, I'm going to run my MD simulations with this bunch of those guys here. Which one will stuck? Which one will form a dimer? Okay, so that I can start thinking about pathway to grow the stuff. And so I have pericondensed aromatics, they call pericondensed aromatic with the branch, aromatic aliphatic linked here, hydrocarbon. So when the link is between two islands, it's called AALH. And so, and for each group, we consider different sizes. So here you can say you have two, or you have four, so I was trying to grow in size. And again, those are the type of results that we um, show. So large clusters are not formed at high temperature. And so what you see here, that is microscopic on the screen, is uh, basically, um, over the, the time, the type of cluster and what are the most um, likely pHs to form. So the main result that we saw, and it was interesting, is that you don't form large cluster at high temperature, but if you have to choose between pHs, what happens is that if they have a branch or you have an aliphatic chain, they are more likely to form some kind of clusters. And so we were thinking about this, and one of the reasons we um, found for this is that the fact that you have this aliphatic chain that can vibrate, rotate, is a way to store the energy. So remember the, the blob that I show you that there's an impact, for example, with the wall? Once there is a bond, 
the, between the atoms, the energy of the collision can be redistributed within the molecule. So the clusters still stay together because the energy is taken by those vibration and rotation. And so we, the sa similarly, what we found is that the clustering, it's uh, um, changes if you have a branching because the branching helps the clustering to um, absorb the energy. And so what we were um, suggesting is that if they form a pHs with an aliphatic branch in, uh, in, in a flame, those are the more likely to form a cluster or dimerize in the system. And so this is the graph which you have the molecular weight here and you have different temperature. Um, and so what you see is that um, the temperature plays a role on, the, of course, the, the formation of the clusters, but also the type, the shape of those pHs it's um, driving those type of interactions. So uh, this is dynamic. So I have a box with pHs and I was looking and see how they interact. Now, let me show you something else. That's uh, more the free energy. So I was mentioning that the time scale could be different. I need something longer. And so one of the trick besides you know, better computers is uh, an algorithm that allow you to do that. And so uh, just to give you an example of what the problem is, um, if you do a normal dynamic, what that means is that, um, again, remember that there is a landscape. There is a potential energy or a free energy landscape. And the fact that your molecules are in this well means, for example, that you see your pyrene is basically finding another pyrene and they are in this simulation, in these conditions, okay? But this is not everything that can happen. You can have a simulation in which maybe they are like this. Okay, this is more favorite, just to give you an example. Now, if you spend all your simulations in this position and you're not able to come out, then you don't know the real story, okay? You know just part of the story. You know a local minimum, but you don't know if that is the, the real things. So, a normal dynamic, the problem is sometimes you get stuck in one of those well. So, we wanted something a little bit different, and this is a technique, it's not, it was developed by um, Parinello, and this is not my movie, but it's cute, so I'll show you, and there is a reference also that. So, this is your landscape, okay? And uh, the idea is that, let's say that you're there, and you wanna explore. Now, if you do with the normal dynamics, you basically, you can take eight days, you can take six days to get all the other valleys in here. But if you mathematically add a little bit of uh, help to your energy, basically is like a feeling the sand, you know, then what you can find is a, a way from an algorithmic point of view to explore all the valleys that you're interested. So what you do, you add the bias, okay, to your potential energy so that your boat goes up. And once you goes up, you can cover all the valleys, you can go and explore the whole system. So you become ergodic somehow. You have to be able to explore the whole potential energy uh, in your simulation. So this is a trick, mathematical trick, but um, it's a way to um, speed things up a little bit. And so with this, we look at the free energy also. And I'm going to show you a couple of results that we obtain with this type of graph. So before I show you the result, let me tell you what that means. So I have, uh, this is just information about the type of um, uh, NAMD is the software that we use. This is the force field. And for some of you that do molecular dynamics, and I know there are a few, this is maybe interesting information. Um, so we look, let's say again, two uh, pHs. If you are this is the COM is the center of mass. So I took my pHs and I computed the center of mass of my molecules. And then the center of mass of the other one. If they are far apart, they are monomers. So as soon as they get close, you can form a dimer, okay? And the point is that from far away, um, they can get closer here. This is a negative free energy, so they really like to be in this position. So the dimer is here, the monomers is here. So I'm going to show you those kind of curves for different pHs. So we look at, again, um, different um, chemistry and uh, physical configuration. And the idea was to see if it's a fully condensed or if it has a branch. This is pyrene, for example. This is a bigger, fully condensed, but bigger size. What kind of, um, what is the free energy to form a dimer? Now, 
This is a result. So what I'm showing you again, those are the curves that are monomers far away and then they get uh, close. So this is a 1000 Kelvin, so still a relatively low temperature for a flame, but the result is that already if you go a 1000 Kelvin, um, the only one, only ovaline and uh, circumcoronin have a, um, basically they, they stay together, okay, as a dimer. Uh, while instead even pyrene, that usually pyrene is used as dimers in any suit model that you find in the literature at this point. Pyrene at 1000 Kelvin is not going to form a dimer. Okay, so you need to reach a certain size like the green or the purple so that your dimers will form a 1000 Kelvin. So this is a first result. What I'm doing is just comparing fully pericondensed pHs and I'm looking at the effect of the mass. I need the big mass for them to stay together. Same MD simulations. And now I'm saying similar size, but I have, uh, um, uh, I'm looking now at the effect of the chains. And so what you see um, that this guy somehow, uh, not Basically, the effect of the chain plays a role in the results that you get. And so there is a static hindrance um, between the difference between those two molecules, basically. And so whether this is um, a double bond or this is a single bond, you will have hindrance. When they get together, it will be more difficult for them to stay together. So the point is that molecular dynamics can help you not only to understand, you know, from an atomistic simulations what's happening to the system, but also the effect of the chemistry and the physics on this material. So um, if you want, just the summary, this uh, vinyl pyrene has less aesthetic hindrance than this guy here. So this is a single chain is rotating a lot with the temperature, so it's moving a lot, and so it will be more difficult um, to find the pair. Um, so, um, one of the results of this simulation is that we develop, we will use these uh, free energy methods to look at the behavior for dimers, basically. And uh, the importance of free energy is because it takes into account the static hindrance also, so the entropic contribution. And I think those are very important when you look at dimerization. Pyrene does not form a dimer in flame condition, at least 1,000 or above. But the presence of chains can change the result. So even if you have something small as a pyrene, but it has a chain, can actually form a dimer compared, you don't need to get to ovaline that is huge for the systems. And so the last thing I wanna show you, this is first of all open question. So if we move forward, those are some questions that I, um, I'm interested in addressing for this. System. So, um, the aliphatic chain, do they play a role in the inception? So does the pH need to have an aliphatic chain to start growing as a bigger size? Um, could they help also during coagulation? You know, if you think about this like an arm coming out of the molecules, can they help with the coagulation of the species? Um, gas phase, always a big point to, um, for especially the pH growth. And also, um, Experiments, we always need experiments, so the temperature, the pH, this is all important data to develop our model. So the last things um, that I wanna show you is that, what do I do with the molecular dynamics if I wanna keep growing? So uh, this is interesting, but this is very specific. When I talk with people from industry or people who do CFD, they don't care about molecular dynamics. They don't care about the fact that your molecule is a chain Right? They want to know what numbers do I need to put in my CFD simulations. So the way we use molecular dynamics is first of all to get insights about the chemistry of the physics. So what are the pH that more likely will form a dimer? And then the next step is to say once we identify those, what is, for example, can we translate this phenomenon into a rate, for example? So that when you run a CFD simulations, you will just plug in the rate with some concentration of those species. So the last thing is this one. Um, for fun, <laughs> uh, we, um, everybody is on way to have fun here, but um, we wanted to see what happened when I have a bigger systems, and uh, we run what they call a coarse graining simulations. And this is another technique in molecular dynamics. I just don't want to mention that. 
But basically, if you have a fuller end, instead of, uh, this is also goes with the fact that these are very slow simulations, so you want to speed up the system a little bit. So we did, um, uh, basically what you do is, coarse graining means you simplify the system. So the water, for example, instead of having um, uh, an oxygen and two hydrogen, what about if I replace my three atoms with one bead, one big atoms, basically, okay? So for some application, this is very interesting because it can allow you to go um, longer in time in the space, you can bigger clusters. Of course, if you're interested in entropic contribution, if you're interested in dipole, you cannot lose this information. So it depends on what you're interested in studying. But we did, um, for fun again, in, there was a fullerene, and instead of having all this chemistry with the 60 carbons, so we said about one carbon, one, one atom. And so um, we basically, what they did, they would partition the system into simpler um, uh, components. And then we did some molecular dynamic simulations. So first of all, um, those are some of the uh, structures that we got from combustion. So fullerene is an ideal case, it's a sphere. But in reality, you have more complex structures. And so with something that looked like this, we decided to reduce the complexity to three atoms, three beads, basically. For something that looked like weird like this, it's not spherical again, we look at different uh, beads, okay? So how many beads is how accurate you want to be and not that. But the point is that um, we ran some of the simulations with this and uh, uh, we studied two millions of atoms basically. And each molecule was uh, replaced by a three side bead. So whether I had the flat or more round particles, I replaced only with three atoms, three beads. And so we ran uh, two millions of simulations. And the point here, I couldn't find the movie I want to show you today, but I found the final data. Um, this is uh, the, simul the, the end of the simulations, basically. So what am I saying here? Is that the simulation was run at flame temperature. It was the first simulation with two million subatoms in flame conditions. And the point is that, th what is the effect of the structures on the formation of the clusters. What we saw is that if your molecules are round, so the structure, the shape, plays a role in the agglomeration, the coagulation that you're looking at. So for the same condition, the same temperature, if the molecule was round, we saw the formation of clusters. If the molecule were flat, we could not see the formation of, uh, we saw some local clusters, but not the, as many as we did with the round particles. So um, again, molecular dynamics allow you to bridge some of the atomistic information, maybe the structures, maybe the chemical composition with the bigger phenomena. There are approximation you can play. You can do coarse graining, for example. But still, what's interesting is that you can link structures with the function, with the type of result that you get. So here, in a flame, for example, in which you get a lot of flat molecules, the likelihood of forming those clusters is less, at least in this simulation, than when you get more round particles. Why is that so? So first of all, this is a great question. So we, we look at uh, uh, structures of, um, if you run an ethylene flames versus a benzene flames, the likelihood that you form uh, like a five member rings in a benzene flames is higher than an ethylene flames. Once you have a fem five member rings, especially embedded in the structures, you have curvature. So the structures that you form in an ethylene versus an aromatic are different. For the same size, I can have a benzene flame with round, and ethylene is flat. And so uh, when I run maker simulations, the fact that they are rounded, it's easier for them to basically um, get stuck with each other. So the structures plays a role in the type of agglomeration that you have. Does that make sense? Also, the flat is more static. So if you want, there are those flapping uh, wings that you saw in the structures here. It's more difficult for them to find a way to get together rather than the, um, than the round particles, the systems. So are these structures minimizing thermodynamic potential? Yes. 
Those are structures that were actually obtained from a simulation we did in a flame and in, uh, in a benzene and, uh, and aliphatic flames. You know that. Yes? So was the composition for also different of the particles? Like one was more carbon to hydrogen? So that's part of the story too. Um, but I think that one is, so that's a great question. Um, when you have uh, a, like a pericondensate, which you have a core that is a highly carbonaceous, they will like to interact with each other. So the, the part is that. If you have uh, an aliphatic with the aromatic on the side, the attraction is different. So the chemical composition, I'm talking only here about the physical growth. There is no reaction. So if there is a reaction, it's more complicated. But if I talk about the physical interaction, having a core that is highly carbonaceous, it's preferred in terms of the attraction. So you are correct. But um, the other thing is that the presence of five member rings. So when I have those, um, the, the contribution of the aromatic part, but also the entropic, the fact that it is around the curvature is also playing a role. And so MD allows you to see those things somehow, something that you cannot do if you solve your system as, you know, A1 plus A2 start, goes to a bigger molecule because you don't retain information about this. So our goal, our interest in molecular dynamics is to find some of those small answers that can then be translated into an equation for uh, bigger systems. So I guess this is my last slide for today. Um, and I think we can stop here and uh, um, continue tomorrow. So hopefully I, go, I gave you a little bit of a glimpse of MD. Tomorrow I'll show you how I really use it <laughs> for my system. <laughs>